some had went along, right? Yes. Um, was it a pretty good sized number or just a few? Well, we know there was a mixed multitude, so that sounds like quite a few, but obviously less than the number of Israelites. Oh, yeah. So exactly what the proportion is, I don't know that we have any real way to tell, except that it was a small enough proportion that those who stuck with them could be absorbed into the tribes. Like Caleb was not originally an Israelite, but he was absorbed into the tribe of Judah. He was adopted. And they would have to live by their rules, or if, they would be out in... Yeah, yeah, if you wanted to stick with them. I mean, people could have said, yeah, we don't like the sound of this covenant. We're going to go back home at Exodus 24, but we're not told that anybody did that. Human nature. Yeah, yes, indeed. Okay, so plunging back into church history... Um, we've been looking at the question of how the church got from the New Testament to the Nicene Creed. And last week we started to look at the accomplishments of the church, especially the church in the second century, after all the apostles are dead, but before you get to the exciting times in the 300s when there's some sharp persecution followed by toleration, followed by a sort of establishment and state support. So in a, in a real way, the span of time from 100 to 200 is absolutely critical here. And the accomplishment we looked at last week was the canon of the New Testament. How it came about that because the Lord gave the books, the church recognized them, starting off from a very high platform of agreement on what you would call the core or the center of the New Testament, and, and some uncertainties, some hesitations, and some differences of opinion on the periphery of the New Testament. And we talked about how that works and what, what the sources are, and so on and so forth. So, in addition to the canon, another great accomplishment of the church was the rule of faith. And we need to qualify that right away in a couple of ways. One is, of course, the rule of faith is not so much an accomplishment of the church as a gift that the Lord gave to the church. The accomplishment of the church was in maintaining it and making it clear in promoting and disseminating it, not in coming up with it. And if you asked any of the apostolic fathers, if you asked any of the people who are sources for the rule of faith, they would tell you, this is not my accomplishment, this is not something I achieved, this is not something I invented or discovered, this is just the continuous teaching from the apostles to the present. So what are we talking about when we talk about the rule of faith? Well, we're talking about the basic doctrinal content of Christianity. But we need to be clear that in the second century, there's not one document you can point to and say, this is the rule of faith, that everybody's using exactly the same version. But nor can you say, therefore nobody has any real idea of what the rule of faith is. It's just a fake concept made up to beat Gnostics over the head. It was used to beat Gnostics over the head, yes, but that wasn't how it got started, and that wasn't a pretense for its existence. So let me illustrate this from the case with a similar body of doctrine, one that we're familiar with. What is Reformed theology? Well, on one extreme, you can't say Reformed theology is whatever R.C. Sproul says, or whatever Charles Hodge says, or whatever John Calvin says. Now, it's true that all three of those gentlemen are Reformed theologians. But does that mean that every idea, every thought, every opinion expresses Reformed theology? No. For one thing, they could have had an idiosyncratic way of expressing things. For one thing, they could just be giving their opinions about things that aren't a part of our faith. They could have made a mistake, etc. But could you find Reformed theology in Calvin and Hodge and Sproul? Absolutely is what you would mostly find there. Yeah. So let's say that other sources disappeared. For, I don't know, you're, you're trapped in an inadequate library and all you have is Calvin Hodge and Sprawl. 
Could you discover what Reformed theology was? Could you write down your own compendium, your own summary of Reformed doctrine based on those three things? Yes, you could. Now, it might not be as full or as detailed on some points, um, and there might even be a place or two where you'd be a little bit idiosyncratic, although I, I'm, I'm trying to remember, and of course you can't carry everything everybody has said in your head all at once. I think between those three, they would probably mutually correct any little, little idiosyncrasies that might come up. But that's not Reformed theology per se. If you wanted to find one place where Reformed theology resides, where you can turn to to say, what is Reformed doctrine? Obviously, it would be the Reformed Confessions. The Heidelberg Catechism, the Belgic Confession, the Canons of Dort. Um, there's a four-volume set, very nice set to have. Um, Reformed Confessions in English translation. It has other things like the Second Helvetic Confession. It has the Westminster Standards. It has documents nobody's ever heard of, like the Sandomir's Consensus and things of that nature. It's got... Zwingli and Bullinger and lots of, lots of different confessional documents from these different people. What's Reformed theology? Well, you could say it's what those documents agree on. It's what they all have in common. One of those documents, I'm not, I'm not remembering exactly which one at the moment, but one of those documents goes out of its way to specify that women have souls. Presumably in Czechoslovakia where this document was authored, there was somebody who was denying that. And so they felt a need to say that women have souls. Now, none of the other confessional documents felt a need to specify that, presumably because it was only in Bohemia that there was anybody crazy enough to deny it to begin with. Is it part of Reformed theology that women have souls? Well, yes. I mean, if you ask the question, yes, that is the Reformed answer. But it's not a question we've asked a whole lot. So you can say Reformed theology is what those documents agree on. <coughs> Well, in a similar way, there's a rule of faith that's operative in the second century. Tertullian explains it one way, Irenaeus explains it a little bit differently. You'll find different sources that mention it, that talk about it, and when they give expression to it, it's not always identical. The words are not identical, but the substance, the heart of it is. So let me read you one from Irenaeus. He was the bishop of Lyon. He's from very early in the history of the church. He was presbyter in Lyon in 177, and he died somewhere around 202. So you see, he's quite early in the history of the church. And he wrote a volume against heresies, um, which attacks Marcion, but mostly attacks Gnosticism. And this is what he says, Book 1, Chapter 10. The church, though dispersed throughout the whole world, even to the ends of the earth, has received from the apostles and their disciples this faith. Now here follows his summary of the faith that has been received. She believes in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and the sea and all things that are in them, and in one Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who became incarnate for our salvation, and in the Holy Spirit, who proclaimed through the prophets the dispensations of God, and the advents, and the birth from a virgin, and the passion, and the resurrection from the dead, and the ascension into heaven in the flesh of the beloved Christ Jesus our Lord, and his future manifestation from heaven in the glory of the Father, to gather all things in one, and to raise up anew all flesh of the whole human race, in order that to Christ Jesus our Lord, and God, and Savior, and King, according to the will of the invisible Father, every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess to him. And that he should execute just judgment towards all. That he may send spiritual wickednesses and the angels who transgressed and became apostates together with the ungodly and unrighteous and wicked and profane among men into everlasting fire. But may, in the exercise of his grace, confer immortality on the righteous and holy and those who have kept his commandments and have persevered in his love, some from the beginning of their Christian course and others from the date of their repentance. And it may surround them with everlasting glory. Okay. The rule of faith. It sounds pretty similar to something, doesn't it? It sounds very much like the Apostles' Creed or like the Nicene Creed. Now, we don't typically make a separate confession that the Lord is the maker of the sea as well as heaven and earth. 
Because we don't believe that the Lord made the sea? No, because the sea is included in heaven and earth. The form of expression could be Polish. He goes on a lot longer about judgment and punishment than we typically do in the creed. But what part of this would you disagree with? What part of this summary that we just read would you challenge? No, I don't believe that. No, that's not in keeping with scripture. No. I, I defy you to find anything in here. Now, there might be things we have questions about. What does he mean when it talks about sending spiritual wickednesses? That's a good question. What does it mean when it talks about send, or the future manifestation from heaven and the glory of the Father to gather all things in one? Now, that's coming straight out of the book of Ephesians. So nobody biblically literate would disagree with that. But what does Irenaeus mean by it? What does Paul mean by it? What would we mean by it? There are questions. But what are you reading here that's sending up red flags? You're like, oh, I don't believe that. I don't belong to the same church that Irenaeus did. Nothing. It's all okay. It's all fine. Why? Well, he gives us the clue to that. They received from the apostles and from their disciples. In other words, Paul taught Timothy. Timothy taught somebody else. And it got to Irenaeus, and through the ages, it has come to us as well. The rule of faith, then, was a basic summary of apostolic doctrine. At this point, you still didn't have the fixed, identical form of words that we can all recite in unison without even having to look at the bulletin. You didn't have that, but you had the beginnings of it. How did something like that begin? Well, it started with the command to baptize, to make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So... People who were converted and brought for baptism would be asked something like, Do you believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth? And they would answer, I do. Do you believe in his only Son, Jesus Christ our Lord? I do. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the forgiveness of sins, and the church? Or you know, whatever particular combination of elements there would be, you'd answer, I do, and then you'd be baptized. As time went by, especially that middle article, God expanded for two reasons. One, it got expanded because people were making mistakes about the doctrine of Christ. And so the confession of Christ was made fuller. But perhaps even a more important reason why it got expanded is that in the New Testament you have all of these references to Christ where, you know, Paul will bring up Christ's name and then he'll talk about Christ a little bit. It's like he can't help himself before he continues with what he was saying. So that's what's called a charismatic expansion. <laughs> Um, basically, the kerygma is the message, the proclamation about Christ that was made. That's just a fancy word for it. How do you spell it? K-E-R-Y-G-M-A. Greek? I wouldn't yes. guess that. Yes. Kerygma. <laughs> you, you know, if a word ends in ma, it's either Dutch or Greek, right? <laughs> Dogma is Greek. Kerygma is Greek. Van Helsema is Dutch. <laughs> okay. So, because in proclaiming Christ, a large part of what you did was you said who he was. So you heap up titles, Lord, Jesus, Christ, only begotten, Son of the Father, etc. And some of it was you would heap up what he did, was born of a virgin, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, etc. And so the baptismal interrogations and the message about Christ were coming together to constitute a form of words that was, that functioned as the rule or the symbol of faith. Now another source for this was the catechetical instruction given to people who were being prepared for baptism. There's a really beautiful series of catechetical lectures from Cyril of Jerusalem um, but we know that, that all the bishops did this. Augustine did this as well. And he talked to them about retaining the symbol that they received in their baptism. In other words, baptism, among other things, was a public profession that they accepted this faith, that they received this rule for their belief. And so from the sacramental side, from the preaching side, from the teaching side, as well as from the opposition to error side, what 
comes out in the form of a creed, is constituted. And there are creeds that go back beyond earlier than the Apostles' Creed, at least in its current form. There's the Old Roman Creed. There's the Creed as Tertullian gives it. There's this, what I would take from Irenaeus to be sort of an off-the-cuff summary. In other words, he didn't sit down and write a creed that other people would recite. He's just, what is this faith? And he dashes it off quickly. Well, in the same way, if you're walking around and you get asked, what is it that you believe? You might launch into the Apostles' Creed, but you might also rephrase. You might you know, spit it out a little bit differently. You might emphasize one thing more than another, depending on who you're talking to. But the content, even if it's expressed in different words, the content is the same. Now, it was important to come to good, clear, fixed expressions, because people don't always do a good job with off-the-cuff summaries. Sometimes you use words not quite accurately. Sometimes you didn't exactly say what you meant to say. So this process of developing a creed was important. But it happened slowly, it happened organically. Now sometimes people take that and they say, aha, that means that people prior to this were not clear about that. Nonsense. You can be clear on what you believe without having an exact form of words. Now, the, the form of words is very, very helpful. I'm not criticizing that. But it's just baloney to say that unless somebody has memorized a particular set of words, then they don't know what they believe. The memorization is extremely helpful, wonderfully valuable. But there are people who can tell you what they believe without using the words that are in the set form. There's no reason for us to believe that the early church didn't know what it believed. On the contrary, there's all kinds of evidence that they did because they were rejecting error again and again. How does Irenaeus write a book against heresies if he can't tell what is a heresy and what is not? He has plenty of confidence that he can tell. Now, don't get me wrong, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and then of course the Fuller Confessional Documents are wonderfully helpful tools. We're not all Irenaeus, who was a theological genius. We may need some help. But with the help of your confession and catechism, you too can detect error and reject it. That's one reason we do teach it to the young people. We don't want them misled by false teaching, which is so prevalent. We want them, no, that's not right. That's Something's off about that. Okay, questions, comments, anything so far? Okay, then let's move on to the second paragraph from Irenaeus that we have here. Just following up with what I've read previously, he says, As I have already observed, the church, having received this preaching and this faith, Although scattered throughout the whole world, yet, as if occupying but one house, carefully preserves it. She also believes these points of doctrine, just as if she had but one soul and one in the same heart. And she proclaims them and teaches them and hands them down with perfect harmony, as if she possessed only one mouth. For although the languages of the world are dissimilar, yet the import of the tradition is one and the same. For the churches which have been planted in Germany do not believe or hand down anything different. Nor do those in Spain, nor those in Gaul, nor those in the East, nor those in Egypt, nor those in Libya, nor those which have been established in the central regions of the world. But as the Son, that creature of God, is one and the same throughout the whole world, so also the preaching of the truth shines everywhere and enlightens all men that are willing to come to a knowledge of the truth. Nor will any one of the rulers in the churches, however highly gifted he may be in point of eloquence, teach doctrines different from these, for no one is greater than the Master, nor, on the other hand, will he who is deficient in power of expression inflict injury on the tradition. For the faith being ever one and the same, neither does one who is able at great length to discourse regarding it make any addition to it, nor does one who can say but little diminish it. Well, there he's getting at what I was talking about, that there might be varieties of expression and the same substance. We're somewhat familiar with that the Second Helvetic Confession, the Three Forms of Unity, the Westminster Standards, they use different forms of expression. They have some areas where they don't overlap, 
The Westminster Confession talks about marriage, for instance, and the Belgic Confession doesn't. But with regard to the substance, the core, the heart, they say the same things, even if they say it in different words. Well, this highlights another advantage of having a clear grasp of your doctrinal core, and that is that the different abilities of your different teachers become less significant. Now, just please understand, I speak as a fool, okay? Throwing this out there, say your best shot at getting to heaven were following my teachings. How great a shot do you have? <laughs> I feel sorry for you, honestly. <laughs> I do. Now, you could have a teacher who was much, 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 much more gifted than I am. You could have Calvin or Irenaeus himself. But still, you'd rather have a core, a, a solid foundation that is agreed on very, very widely. And so when you're looking for a minister, which hopefully you won't be for a while, <laughs> when you're looking for a minister, gifts are important, but gifts are not the most important thing. A fact for which I'm rather thankful personally. Because this commitment to the core of orthodoxy will assure you that even if one guy can explain things more brilliantly, more deeply, more resoundingly than another, the doctrine that you're getting is what really counts. And this is one of the challenges that comes to us. You know, for very dynamic, very talented, very gifted speakers, it's usually not that hard in, in today's day and age to build up a church of a certain size. I mean, you have to make the smart choices, right? Like you have to go be a youth pastor at a mega church, and then, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's a whole career track that's laid out for people who want to follow it. If you've got the gifts, by and large, the congregation falls. But what happens then? You build up a mushroom congregation that can disappear about as quickly as it began. I'll give you one example, and it's not to pick on this fellow particularly, but just because it's so clear and so vivid. In fact, I'll give you some additional examples, so it's clear I'm not picking on him. You might remember, you might have heard of Mark Driscoll, who started the Mars Hill Church in the Seattle, Washington area. He resigned. By the end of that year, the church closed its doors. What? Apparently, the church could not survive without the man. There's something not right there. Now, when you have extremely talented individuals, there's always this danger. To some extent, it happened in Spurgeon's tabernacle. Spurgeon died. The congregation wanted a very gifted person. Yeah, understandably, they had a very gifted person, and they didn't want to take a step backwards. But they hired people who didn't share all of Spurgeon's commitments, and eventually they hired Spurgeon's son. And, and Spurgeon's son was not terrible. But the tabernacle really went downhill in many ways after Spurgeon's death. Or similar situation, Westminster Chapel with Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. I think probably, hands down, the best preacher of last century, the 20th century. I mean, electrifying, wow. Gift Wow. I mean, you hear a sermon by him, it sticks in your head. His accent and his rhetoric and everything is just fantastic for, for speaking. He had to retire because of health, and the congregation what? wanted to get a gifted man. The gifted man they hired to replace him, R.T. Kendall, took the church in an utterly wrong and horrible direction and almost destroyed. And, and to this day, Westminster Chapel has not recovered. What are we looking for? If we're looking for the moving speeches, we may be led astray to give somebody who can give us a moving speech 
without the commitment to the core doctrine. Now, I, you know, I've mentioned three cautionary tales, and that's part of the reason for our Constitution, for our order of government, for having the elders be so responsible for so many things, so that if the pastor debunks and, and, and vanishes somewhere, the church doesn't fall apart. And that's not the only reason. Obviously, the more important reason is that the Bible mandates elders. But why? Well, that's part of the reason for a stability that you don't get when the minister's gifts and abilities may be all over the map. You may go from one to the other to the other. But the doctrine, if you find a minister who has the core doctrine, and if you have elders who are committed to that core doctrine, that gives a tremendous stability to the church so that it can survive. And as we've seen, our churches survive even extended periods without a minister. How does that happen? Well, the rule of faith is part of it. You don't need the theological expert to know what you believe. And I, I'm not trying to minimize my role, but seriously, you guys can survive without me. Because you have, a, this is one of the things you have, one of the resources, you have the rule of faith. Okay, questions, comments, concerns? I got a comment. Yes. Um, and I think that's, as a church, we're so careful to examine mm -hmm. our guys because of that yes. core belief set of doctrine. You know, that, I mean, gifts are certainly, we do look for gifts. And along those lines, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget this when Reverend Al Puche, I can say this, he's not here. <laughs> Although, I would say it keeps. Uh, you know, he gave an excellent exam, but then he, you know, he did a devotion afterwards, or how were they, you know, because they're required to speak. And I remember Sam Powell, Reverend Powell, telling me right afterwards, he said, you know, that's the best sermon I've heard in a long time. So, I mean, he recognized his gift to communicate the gospel. Right. You, know, I, you know, it didn't necessarily strike me as that way, sure. but it did Sam, which, you know, he probably got better hearing than I do. You know. <laughs> but uh, I'm just saying, so both those things mm -hmm. we need in men, and, yeah. and not all of them are going to be gifted the same. Right. But, but you're right, we need to be jealous of that, those core doctrines, because anything else is... It, yes. You know, a secondary yes. to that, I guess, is yes. the way to say it. Yes. You know, I think in a in an exam and a call and everything, you are looking for gifts because you don't want to put an unqualified person out there. I've heard, you know, the football analogy that you don't want to take the scrawny 98-pound kid and make him your fullback, right? That would not be good. Um, if you're going to send him out among full-size football players, he's going to get eaten alive. So you do want somebody with, with the necessary gifts, with the necessary qualifications. You want to look for that commitment to orthodoxy. That's what I was talking about today. Of course, you want to look for the grace, for the, the heart that will love the people, that will be gentle and considerate and proactive and all of those other things. And when you see all those three things, then I think you have fairly good confidence. But my point about the gifts and, and you know what you were saying, the gifts can come in varieties and different phases of development, just in different amounts. I mean, we heard some amazing speeches on the floor of Synod. And then we heard some people who fumbled to get through what they had to say. It doesn't mean that one was more accurate than the other. The gift of, the gift of gab can be quite detachable <laughs> from the gift of content or from the gift of understanding or from the gift of discernment. And fortunately, on the floor of Synod, we heard people who had both things. <laughs> but, and, and volumes. But, you know, some people are much more gifted to get up and talk than others. Um, I think my dad can preach practically extemporaneously. I mean, I've seen him preach on 15 minutes notice. No trouble at all. You, you would never have guessed that he hadn't put a lot of work into that mm. sermon. It was great. Other people... Oh, they panic if you give them that kind of an idea, and they're struggling. I mean, I was sitting in a class at seminary, and the, the guy who was supposed to do chapel didn't show up. 
and we're looking around at one another, okay, so who's going to fill in for him? One of the professors ran and got an article from his office that he was, had written and read it instead. And I'm sitting there thinking, theoretically, this is a room full of preachers. None of us is ready to stand up and say something? <laughs> what, what is going on here? Well, some people are much more gifted at being extemporaneous than others. That's not a grace. That's not a record. Five years from now when you need it is don't let your preferences for a particular kind of gifting for somebody whose rhetoric is smooth and flowing or whatever don't let that disguise from you the more real qualities the commitment to the doctrine and the grace that is needed to share the gospel with you and with other people as well okay Oh, yes, Taylor. Well, and gifts, you know, it's not something that you can always measure. So the most gifted man, there's going to be someone there that he just doesn't reach. Or it just doesn't. So, you know, what I, what I, a, a certain pastor that maybe has really blessed me <coughs> leaves somebody else cold. Yes. So you can't, you just don't know. Yes. And in ways, happen. even like, you know, when you're being the judge there, sometimes like in retrospect, you're like, oh, I really did get a lot from that man. Right, right, yes, that just happens can't too. Go by personalities. Right, absolutely. Eric, I saw your hand. You know, the, example, the examples of these churches that fall out of the way when the man leaves, you know, just points to the fact that we're sheep and we're easily led one way or the other. Sure. And so sure. that's why this you know, doctrine is important and creeds are important. Right. And or including who's in the pulpit is, is that in alignment with God? That's the main one. Exactly. It really does give you a very practical way to mm -hmm. hold even the biggest celebrity to to hold their feet to the fire. And it's an interesting thing. You very rarely get a celebrity ministry in a confessional church. I'm not saying it never happens, mm -hmm. but you don't have a lot of celebrities whose feet are being held to the fire by their spiritual well, it's counsel or by their classes. It's hard to flourish with that kind of dynamic speaker with, with that kind There's of constraints. culture. Yeah. Right? So yeah. they're not going to go there. Yes. They're going to go where they're I, I'm not saying that in Presbyterian and Reformed circles we don't have any very dynamic speakers or anything like that. But the, the culture of the church and the fact that I am accountable. I can't say whatever pops into my head. I've got to stick with the rule of faith that we have. It does counteract to some extent celebrity culture. I mean, we're, uh, even as Reformed people, we're still guilty of this. I mean, we run around to conferences to hear the big names or whatever. There's Carl Truman's coming into town. Are you aware of that? Yes. Yes, I am. That's yes. Friday and Saturday. Our ex-dog used to correspond with him. Our ex-dog used to correspond oh, with Carl Truman. <laughs> okay. I heard right. And that's, that's one of the things I like about Carl Truman. He would actually answer letters from a three-legged German shepherd. Not many, not many people do that. So, okay, we better stop recording before anybody asks me for an explanation of all of that. I think that needs some video. Yeah, We'll stop the video, and then we'll explain it. Off the record. <laughs> all right, let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time together, for the joy that it is to interact and to learn from the history of your church. We thank you for the rule of faith for men like Irenaeus, who maintained it, who taught it, who defended it. Lord, we pray that you would help us in our own times to be faithful, that we would retain the precious things that have been entrusted to us, that we would pass them on entire and complete and pure to those who come after us. Bless us and strengthen us as a church, as a classes as a denomination, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.